So, um, welcome to the second day of the symposium. I'm so excited for all the panels and all the presentations that, that we're going to have today. It's wonderful to see uh, so many familiar and new faces here. Um, so, our first panel is the panel on literary futures. And let's see, before we get started, I wanted to give a couple of reminders. Number one, if you have not emailed your presentation to Mari or given it or put it on a flash drive, then please come up to me in a break and we will arrange how to get your presentation onto our laptop. And the other thing is we are only supposed to eat in this room. I think maybe all of you were here when we said that, but just please do keep your snacks and everything in here. Also, we're gonna have lunch and you can take your boxes outside if the weather is nice, but you know, keep them shut and then open them outside. Um, okay, I think that's all the housekeeping stuff for now. And I would like to turn it over to my colleague Monica Ghosh, the South Asian Studies Librarian and Chair of the Chair of what? Asia Collection. Asia Collection. <laughs> here at the library to moderate this panel and introduce our wonderful presenters. So thank you. Aloha, Maika Ko. You're supposed to say aloha back. Aloha. <laughs> so anytime you're greeted in Hawaii and somebody says aloha to you, you're supposed to, it's a call and response kind of thing. So it's not just a one way thing. The, the feeling is supposed to be mutual. Anyway, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. I am delighted to be chairing this panel and I just want to say we have two presenters whose uh, papers sound fascinating. So I'm really just going to tell you the titles of their papers and who they are and where they're affiliated. Uh, and then I'll leave it up to them to really talk about their presentations. So the first paper is Utopian Histories, The Places and Times of Rahul Sankrityans, Vaisvin Sadi by Anju Parvati Biju. And Anju is at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I just a little note, side note, Anju, my colleague who's the Russia and Asia librarian and selector, picked out four titles for you to look at in the back about the relationship between Russia and South Asia and this kind of exchange that occurred over time. And I think this novel is so particularly interesting because of the date that it was written and the inspiration of the Russian Revolution. So I will turn it over to Anju to, to do the, her presentation and then we'll go to our next presenter, which I have a lot to say about that. And, <laughs> and then uh, we'll open up for Q&A. And do take your time because uh, you do have some time today because it's just the two of you. But I will send out little signals. Sure. Hi everyone, so the presentation is called Utopian Histories, the Places and Times of Rahul Sankritya in his Spice Field Study. Um, and um, who's going to start? Uh, Rahul Sankritya in his introduction to the first edition of his Utopian text, Spice Field Study, or the 20, 21st, sorry, 22nd century, uh, defines it loosely as a traveler. Uh, in his later autobiographical reflections, he claims to have had no specific knowledge of Bolshevism uh, or Marxism and had not even heard of the term utopia at that time. Only the vague news of the Russian Revolution had reached him through the Pradap newspaper, uh, which sparked the idea for the kind of society that he depicts in Bayes v. Sadi. He reasoned that since he did not have knowledge of Marxist theory, Thinking and imagination of such, a, of such a socialist society was necessarily utopian in the literal sense. Written in the late 1910s and published later in 1924, Bhai Sadi reflects the tensions in how Sankhyayan himself thought about his work, uh, as I've just detailed, um, that is the impulse towards travel and movement uh, with a finely tuned sensibility towards places and their specificity, combined with a vaguer detailing of a utopian state inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution. 
frequently referred to and anthologized as one of the first science fiction texts in modern South Asia, uh, Bias Pisadi is a reflection of the political and technological optimism that characterizes both socialist and anti-colonial imaginaries across the globe in the early 20th century. It is a future that is born of centralized planning which puts the human at the center of development but also makes him the subject of various interventions. Even amidst this vague uniformity, the nature of the text as a travelogue and not just an ideological manifesto uh, reveals Sankatyayan's attachment to faces and their historicity. Uh, the movement towards the future contains within it the traces of the past, even if it is total transformation and disjuncture that the text puts forward as the characteristic relation between the 22nd century future that it imagines and the past from which the lead character comes. This presentation hopes to both unpack the specific modernist utopian vision of Pais Pisadi that participates in a global 20th century imaginary of development and social justice, but also point, point towards its disjunctures and psychic attachments as it relates to other places and times. Uh, but before that, a very quick biography of Sakatyayan. Um, so this is him, uh, his dates are 1893 to 1963. Uh, and he was born in 1893 to a Brahmin family as Kedanath Pandey in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, he was fluent in Urdu, Nagri, Sanskrit, Arabic, Pali, Tibetan, and English, even though he never earned a formal degree. Uh, but he was more attracted to an itinerant lifestyle, wandering across various Buddhist sites in India, Nepal, Tibet, Sri Lanka, and Central Asia. Uh, during the period in which Pais V. Sadi was written, he was under the influence of the reformist Hindu organization, Arya Samaj. But even during this time, certain features of Buddhism and socialism were deeply attractive to him. Reform, nationalism, a nascent Gandhian perspective were all in the air during the 1910s, and Sankatyayan too would be molded by this atmosphere. Scholarly biographers of Sankatyayan like al uh, usually divide his life into distinct phases. An <coughs> early Arya Samajist phase, um, where this particular text by Sri was written, a Buddhist phase leading up to his official conversion in Sri Lanka to Buddhism in 1931, and finally his turning away from Buddhism to communism after a visit to Russia in 1937 and he continues his communist commitments until the end of his life. A lifelong interest in peasant welfare eventually led him to formally join the Communist Party, even when his deeper historical studies and collection of Buddhist manuscripts from Tibet and Nepal led to him writing important works like Manav Samaj in 1942, uh, which, is a, which was a historical study of the development of human civilization from its very origins, Volga Seganga in 1942, which were short stories based on the study, and Madhya Asia Kapitihas, or the history of Central Asia in 1952. While his autobiography confirms these distinct phases, it is tough to consign Vais Visavi as solely an Arya Samadhist text. Not only does it openly proclaim its affiliation with the new revolutionary developments in Russia, it also contains within its utopian floor plan of a new society, historical traces that indicate an alternative history of modernist utopianism, namely Buddhist ideas of equality and social organization as he interpreted it. Set in um, the year 2124, uh, Bhai Sadi follows Vishwabandhu, a young scholar from Nalanda University, uh, who is from the year 1624, and he emerges after a slumber of many years, um, centuries, from a cave he was meditating in, and he steps into the modern age in the 22nd century. Uh, and Sankatan is uninterested in explaining the mechanics of what we could call time travel here. How did this person get there? He doesn't answer that. Uh, it is as natural as waking up from slumber. Vishwabandhu, or like the literal translation is friend of the world, whose characteristic attitude towards this new world may be called curiosity, and the word he uses for this is kautuhul, is nevertheless never disoriented or shocked over the course of his orientation into the 
as well. From the cave, he travels to and resides in the nearby imaginary village of apple cultivators called Save Gram and travels further down to historic Nalanda. Uh, that's the basic trajectory of this journey that he undertakes in Spice We Sell. Uh, and then he meets various villagers um, uh, specializing in specific products in distinct villages. Uh, so a little bit about its formal features. Um, what fuels this loose narrative in mo is movement and observation, almost exactly like a traveler. The foreign land is systematically mapped by Vishwabandhu's first person uh, narrative through his observation, and which is further augmented by the conversations he has with the residents of this village, who are not shocked by his sudden appearance either. Nobody is shocked, nobody is surprised. Um, it's a very natural entry into the 22nd century. So tension, disorientation, conflict, danger, and resolution, typical narrative features of both fantasy and science fiction are noticeably missing in Bias Visali. Narrative energy is almost entirely taken out by the disappearance of such factors as also the disinclination to psychologize. Instead, gaze, description, and dialogue create a synchronic map of industrialized farming where on a superficial reading, history is not an important concern except as a past that was overcome. Society in the 22nd century is a scientific pastoral utopia where technology and mechanization has created a perfect society with no equality, uh, no sorry, no inequality, very important, no inequality, no property, and no currency. <coughs> Everyone is educated the same way, everyone gets to work according to their tastes and inclinations, the child rearing is communal, all service activities including cooking and cleaning have been mechanized. Crucially, technological utopia in Sankatyayan's vision does not include urbanization. The modern village is the foundational unit of the synchronic structure. Uh, Frederick Jameson, in his study of the formal features of utopian writing, draws a comparison between the utopian form and the pre-modern pre fairy tale. For him, I'm quoting here, this is the first quote, utopian writing, uh, sorry, utopian form carries within it this memory of the land and the village, this half-forgotten trace of the experience of peasant solidarity and collectivity. This obsession with land is far more literal in Bayes vis a -vis than in the European text that Jameson deals with. Modernization is not in conflict with a bucolic vision of present peasant prosperity. Clearly, this vision of the village in Bayes vis a -vis is in conversation with the other utopian vision of rurality that dominates the 1910s, uh, that's Gandhi's Hind Swaraj published in 1909. If the self-sufficient village was the root of nationalist vision in Hind Swaraj, where the village is capable of producing everything that it needs, Sankatyayan imagines each village specializing in the production of specific essential goods, which it then trades with others based on the demand. So for example, Sebram cultivate, cultivates and trades apples, Dal Gram does the same with dal or lentils, Dalji Gram does the same with clothes, and so on. Nobody is paid a wage, food is served communally, nothing is provided to anyone that all the others do not already have. The city is only passingly mentioned without any kind of detailing. He's simply not interested in that space. So absolute is the power of technology and knowledge, which he uses the Hindi word vigyan, um, that fuels the technology, that it appears as though it is technology itself that is the driver of social change. In a remarkable passage, Sankatyayan details the use of machines to clear human feces. Uh, this is a passage from Bayes V. Sadi, and I've just highlighted what I'm reading from. Piche ye bhi malum hua ki sab pakhanon ke liye bhangi nahi hai. Bhangi to koi jati bhi nahi hai. Idhar mela gitta jata hai, aur udhar machine us par miti fengti jati hai. Uh, very rough translation would be, I found out that there were no castes designated to clean toilets. In fact, there is simply no caste um, uh, called that. The waste falls here and that is where the machine spreads dirt over it. Uh, it is because of the existence of this machine that the caste hierarchy that separates Dalit castes who traditionally cleaned this waste from upper castes who considered them untouchable was abolished. There seems to be no social confrontation that led to this iteration of caste, it is just magic out of technology. 
Uh, in contrast to the state of physical well-being in human beings, social organization towards ideal production and the lack of social hierarchies and strife between groups, we have posed a vision of decay, discord and disease in the times that Vishwabandhu had traveled from. Uh, in a speech to the residents of Sepram, he declares, There were many people who would beg from village to village to fill their stomachs. But in the same society, there were many Nawabs, Rajas, Babus, Talukars, etc. who all belonged to the elite section. Shariq ki seva ke liye bahut se stri purush parcharon ko ki avashyakta thi. Just for the service of the body, that is the service of, for, of the body for the uh, elite class, these folks needed both male and female attendance. Uh, in response to the social situation of hierarchy, where some starved while others dropped in excess, the pundits would say, Dhani gari, Raja Praja, apne apne purva janma ki kamai se hoti hai, hoti hai. Ye sanatan se chala aya hai, yehi bhagwan ki itcha hai. Uh, rich or poor, king or subject, these social locations occur due to the moral earnings of the previous birth. This has come down to us from the Sanatan faith. This is God's volition or plan. Uh, Santadhyayan here condemns the Hindu order that naturalizes inequality and class and caste hierarchy as God's will. Uh, Vishwabandhu continues that those who wanted to reform the society were back then they were called Pagal or Adharmi, which is like you know mad or people who were not religious. Yet these tensions from the past, which hint at the difficulty of manifesting a new world against the upholders of power in the old one, is never really addressed. The explicit vision of the past, delivered in oratory form, like he delivers a speech to the residents, exists only to be contrasted with the progress of the 22nd century. It seems like a very literal adoption of Jameson's definition of the utopian idea as keeping um, alive the possibility of a world, quality, this is the second quote, qualitatively distinct from this one, and takes the form of a stubborn negation of all that is. This qualitative distinction and negation are never practically accounted for within the logic of the plot as causality. Who admissioned the society? What led to the overthrow of older systems of class, gender, and caste oppression? How did the older society overcome religious sectarianism and violence? These are the identifying features of the archaic society, but conflict and revolution are never alluded to in the text. Instead, progress is rational. Arctic currency, for economic reasons, people stopped identifying themselves through religion, people set aside their own greed for cooperation when logic dictated that they have more to gain through it. Utopia is thus presented as a logical progression of self-interest meeting community interests. This elision of conflict and dissension also goes hand in glove with the totalizing, homogenizing vision of a world community. Scientific, scholarly, and material progress has completely erased divisions of sex, race, and religion in the 22nd century. People's food, clothes, curriculum, skin color, religion, nothing is of difference anymore. For the practical necessity of existing in a connected world, people have also evolved a single language for communication in the subcontinent. Bhartiya, which is effectively which he calls in the Urdu, uh, but which follows the Nagari script. Uh, as one of the characters um, mentions, Sakka Bhasha Ek Hojai, everyone's language should become one. Uh, this human centric vision also extends to its treatment of animals. Animals do not exist either in the wild nor in the farms. The males and females are separated so that they do not mate. One of each is then kept in a lab to mate, okay, to mate um, only as per human needs and curiosity. So, nature too is like curated for human consumption. Um, but is the past in Bayes v. Sadi just meant as a contrast to the present? Does it offer a vision of the past that does not just depend on its supersession? Uh, is the text just about modernist technological optimism? Um, so here, uh, it's best for us to turn towards the most important um, like locus point for him, which is the Nalanda Mahavihara. Um, in uh, the text. So uh, located in the modern Indian state of Bihar, uh, the monastic complex of Nalanda was established by Buddhist monks in the 15th century. 
Up until the 12th century, it would grow to be reputed as one of the greatest monastic educational establishments in Asia and the most important center of Asian Buddhist learning. Um, so there's a lot of controversy over what happens to it. People don't know why it suddenly declined in the 14th century. Uh, the popular explanation for this, uh, especially in Indian nationalist accounts, is that uh, it was due to the sacking by the Mamluk ruler, Bhaktiya Khilji. Uh, in any case, Nalanda was abandoned at this time and it faded from popular memory until the 1860s, where it became a nationalist talking point through the excavations of the site by Alexander Cunningham and the archaeological survey of India back then. Uh, so Sankritya, so there's this, there's this atmosphere where like the, ex the discovery of Nalanda would set up like a new uh, kind of um, angle in the anti-colonial movement, uh, new connections, new pan-Asian connections. Uh, in Vice Visadi, the engine of progress emanates from knowledge and the center for knowledge is Nalanda. I'm not going to read the Hindi one, I'll just read the translation. Uh, Nalanda is a vast university now, uh, there is no better university in the globe for philosophy and history. Students come from all over the world to study there. The best arrangement to study and teach various ancient um, scripts and languages has, has been made in Nalanda. While plenty of descriptions of Nalanda's punarudhar or restoration abound in the text, Sankhitayan himself never invokes the popular early 20th century Hindu revivalist idea of its sacking as the decline of ancient Indian glory. It is not against the nationalist idea of um, Buddhist decline, Indic decline, that against which he poses the revival of Nalanda. It remains unexplained in the text why Nalanda had to be restored. Is it due to the attacks by Kilji? We don't know. And when it is restored in the text, it follows the same model of pedagogy as the medieval age that was described, as, as it was in the medieval age. It's almost as though the future goes back to the past. Um, can you tell me exactly how much time I have? I'll just sum up. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, the reference to the unit of the Bhumandal or globe is also interesting. No longer is Nalanda a mere national treasure, it has been restored to its original role as a node in a greater pan Asian network with an even wider reach now. In fact, the ancient world of connections where Northern India participated as an equal with others, be it with the Himalayan networks of Nepal and Tibet, or Indian Ocean ones connecting Sri Lanka, Borneo, and Java, among others, are repeatedly invoked in the text through the travel that various characters undertake. Um, so, and these are all activities that Sankatyayan himself part partook in. Uh, such a cosmopolitan attitude against mere nationalist pride is also seen in the figures that are invoked a lot in this text. Rousseau, Marx, Buddha, Engels, Socrates, Plato, Lenin, Newton. So it's not really like a parochial vision. Um, so, now, so one thing that I kind of wanted to explain is this, that Nalanda and Greater Asia that is invoked in this text does not neatly fit into the framework of revival versus futurism that I have explained. Uh, while medieval Buddhism does provide the map for a connected cosmopolitan world undermining the primacy of the nation state, the idea of an Indocentric Greater Asia that emerges in Bayeski Sadi is ambivalent in its potential. Uh, while it can be the basis for anti colonial cooperation and pan Asian links in the early to the mid 20th century, it could also be used to bolster hegemonic ideas of Indic glory exclusive of South Asia's Islamic past, as recent scholarship like um, this book, Visions of Greater India, has shown us. Um, I'll just end with this, uh, with a reference to one of his later works where we see this connection between the past um, and, and like the present anti-colonial anti -colonial movement come through in like more clarity. Uh, that's Volga Se Ganga uh, in 1942 or Volga to Ganga. Uh, so if conflict and violence that implies change were subsumed in Bayes Pisadi's utopian vision, it is not in this work of 15 essays dealing with a specific historic epoch from 6000 BC to 1942 AD, uh, which, and it starts from like, that's the first story, which starts from like uh, right next to the Volga River, where the Indo-European culture originated and from, uh, from where Aryans made their way with great violence and conflict into the subcontinent. South Asia is marked in the text as a place which sees waves of migration, 
without any moralistic remarks on who the original inhabitants might be. Here, the coming of the Mamluks are not portrayed as an exceptional event. It is of a piece with an older history of migration. Death, violence, hierarchy, disorder predominate in all phases of history. Society is created through such conflict. So the, this kind of dynamism that's missing in Bayes vis is something that's, that's, that you see here. Um, so uh, the final thing that I'll just wrap up with is that um, is a very interesting quote from Jameson, uh, which I think really helps us connect like a, the idea of historical fantasy with the idea of utopia. Uh, utopia is philosophically analogous to the trace, only from the other end of time. Uh, the apology of the trace is to belong to the past and the present all at once. Utopia, which combines the not yet being of the future with a textual existence in the present, is no less worthy of the archaeologies we are willing to grant to the trace. So in a way, I see Volga Seganga uh, doing the same work it, when it's put right next to Bayes V. Sadi. Uh, it hints at the deeper time and the epochal supersessions that leave a trace in modern geographical and political imaginaries. Bayes V. Sadi, from the other end of time, contains within it, even if not fully elaborated, the archaeology of the past in its utopian future. Paying attention to this dialectic produces a more interesting contribution from Santagyan than reading Bayes Visadi alone as a utopian fable about the triumph of modernization. Thank you, Anju, for that really thought-provoking and complex presentation about the novel. Um, where I think Anna's just setting up for Nudrat. While she's doing that, I'll just introduce Nudrat Kamal, who's uh, also from the University of Pennsylvania. I think they coordinated this trip quite right. <laughs> you know, who am I to say? Um, Nudrat's uh, presentation is titled, as you can see from the program, Dreaming Futures, Speculative Fictions, Imagining of Pakistan's Future. I just wanted to, I sort of mentioned earlier that uh, I would say something about Nudrat, but what, what happened is last year at our symposium, which was completely online, Nudrat made a presentation at that conference, and I was chairing it as well, and her presentation evoked the most questions and comments, and I went back to the committee the following year and I said, Let's do it on futures. There's such an interest. I mean, I've never seen that kind of really interaction with the audience, and this was all online. So I want to thank Nadrat for her provocative talk last year, and I think her presentation this year will be equally, if not more, fascinating. The particular short film that she refers to in her presentation, uh, if you haven't seen it, please take the time to see it. It is nine minutes and totally worth it. I've been promoting it with everybody I know and hopefully we'll sh you share more about yes. it in your presentation. Thank you. Nadra. Thank you so much, Monica. It was such a lovely generative conversation that we had had uh, last year and was online and I was a, a little bit sad that I couldn't visit in person. So I'm just very delighted to be here to have this kind of conversation. This is part of my larger work um, and so this is one aspect of it that I wanted to share with you all. Um, sorry. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to also note that they, I'm using artwork from uh, various Pakistani artists. I'm not directly speaking about them, but I thought that they're, they're interesting and they should be more known. They're all online and the names are there. Um, So these are the two um, sort of framings that uh, that I begin my talk with. So one of them is Jameson. Uh, clearly, Jameson is sort of uh, generative for both of us. Um, so I'll read it out loud. Um, the most characteristic science fiction does not seriously attempt to imagine the real future of our social system. Rather, its multiple mock futures serve the quite different function of transforming our own present into the determinate past of something yet to come. And then the second one is by Upinder Mehem, who um, co-edited this anthology for So Long Been Dreaming, Post-Colonial Science Fiction and Fantasy. So he says, visions of the future imagine how life might be otherwise. 
If we do not imagine our futures, post-colonial peoples risk being condemned to be spoken about and for again. Um, right. So the act of imagining and speculating different kinds of future societies is a creative endeavor as well as a political and philosophical one. From Plato's Republic, which culminates in the articulation of a utopian city-state ruled by a philosopher king, to the vision of a perfect society ruled by Muslim philosophers expressed in Al-Farabi's 9th century treatise Al-Madina Al-Fadila, or The Virtuous City, to 17th century writer Margaret Cavendish's The Description of a New World, or The Blazing World, which is about a perfect, divisionless society, writers and thinkers for centuries have been involved in constructing imaginary societies that help clarify their ideas about the futures of their own. But it was from the mid-19th century onwards, in the wake of the Age of Enlightenment and the acceleration of the intertwined projects of capitalism and colonialism, which undergirded Western modernity, that visions of the future began to be solidified in the form of the distinct literary genre of science fiction. Entangled as modernity is with ideas of both scientific and social progress, it was a particularly well-suited period for futuristic visions, more so than the historical periods that came before. To grapple with the dynamic change that characterizes modernity, many futuristic sci-fi texts emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries, a flowering that continues to this day. However, just as modernity is intertwined with the Western imperial project, the development of the science fiction genre too has a particular colonial history. According to Adam Roberts, science fiction serves as the, quote, dark subconscious to the thinking mind of imperialism, unquote. The seedy underbelly hidden beneath the rationalistic veneer given to colonial and neocolonial ideas. The origins of science fiction can in fact be contextualized as a product of imperialist culture, beginning in late 19th century Britain, British fantasies of global conquest. After all, the two biggest myths in science fiction are that of the stranger, the alien, whether it's extraterrestrial, technological, or human hybrid, and the strange land, the faraway planet or distant part of our own waiting to be conquered. And both these myths also serve as the pillars of the Western colonial project. But just as this genre of science fiction has been a vehicle to explore and further imperial fantasies, it also has the generic tools through which critiques of colonialism and racism can be enacted through which non-white people can tell their own stories. Science fiction's exploration of otherness and marginality and its potential for imagining more equitable futures lends itself well to a post-colonial ethos. Many science fiction writers from colonized and formerly colonized places have embraced this potential, which has led to a hybrid kind of science fiction known as post-colonial science fiction. Post-colonial science fiction can be defined as that particular kind of science fiction that acknowledges and then subverts in different ways the genre's genealogical and ideological debt to colonialism. The term post-colonial science fiction is used to keep in mind while tracing the trajectory of futuristic visions in South Asia, the origin of which can be traced to the early 19th century. Much of the science fiction being written in the subcontinent since the 19th century, according to Saparno Banerjee, recontextualized modernity, quote, not only within the Enlightenment tradition, but also within a mythic rebirth of ancient Indian wisdom, or traditions that question modernity itself by imagining alternative ways of being, end quote. In contrast to visions of the future that came from the mind of writers from Western Europe and North America, South Asian visions of the future have a more complicated relationship to modernity, because the subcontinent's own relationship to modernity has been shaped by its colonial past, and continues to be mediated by neocolonialism and global capitalism. It is therefore worth investigating the specificities of such futuristic texts to see whether they can be gathered into visions of a collective and transnational future for South Asia, which we might call South Asian futurism. I argue that this body of South Asian futurisms offers a vibrant poetics and vocabulary to explore questions of the impacts of neocolonialism, global capitalism, religious nationalism, and increasingly climate change on the subcontinent. Within this larger body of South Asian futurisms, this paper will trace the futuristic visions articulated by three Pakistani writers and artists to explore the kind of futures that are being envisaged by writers who are located in specific local socio-political contexts of Pakistan and who are drawing on various Pakistani histories and cultures. 
exploring Urdu satirist writer Muhammad Khalid Akhtar's dystopian novella Bees Sogyara or 2011 published in 1954, the animated Urdu short film Shehre Tabassum or The City of Smiles created by Arafat Mazhar in 2020 and the English language short story Nearly Human by Kehkashan Khalid published in 2021. This paper will argue that in contrast to the anti-colonial and anti-capitalist utopias of 19th and early 20th colonial India, Pakistani futuristic visions both immediately after partition and today are much more somber, tilting towards dystopias that express post-colonial anxieties mixed with more muted utopian impulses. I would like to begin my analysis with Mohammad Khalid Akhtar's Bees Sogyara. Um, which was published in Karachi 1954. Unlike in some other languages of South Asia, in Urdu, in Urdu we find multi-genre hybrid works that combine elements of science fiction with fantasy, horror, mystery, and adventure in serialized stories published in pulp magazines and periodicals. However, a robust tradition of pure science fictional works is harder to find. This is what makes Bisto Gyara all the more noteworthy. Although depicting a dystopian future, it is far from being dark or somber in tone, adopting instead the ironic, humorous, and playful tone of earlier 20th century utopian works that emerged in the subcontinent and applying it to an absurd dystopia. The novella begins in a 21st century, which is reeling from the destruction wrought upon the world after a great war in 1992. It is narrated from the perspective of Mr. Popo, the president of the fictional country of Yok Yokna Patawa, who is invited by the government of the state of Mazni to, to, to tour its capital city, Shutruba, and whose com compilation of a report of this tour forms the bulk of the novella. Apart from being a president, Mr. Popo is also something of an amateur anthropologist and considers himself a man of the people. And so his report is filled with his insights into the cultural, so social, and economic conditions of Mazni a futuristic country which is clearly meant to be a satire on the newly formed Pakistani state. The fascist surveillance state of Mazni is, is indicated by the presence of a special police category called the Kulk Much, an acronym for Pakarlo Jisko Marzi Chahe, which means arrest anyone you want. Uh, the state machinery includes the Wazir -e Jhut, the Minister of Lies, and the Wazir -e Jabalat, the, the Minister of Ignorance, and, identical twin, and these identical twin brothers run the Ministry of Food and the Ministry of Finance. The few women that are visible on the streets are enclosed in kiosks made out of tin and fitted with headlamps, side horns, and small wheels. A dystopian critique of the gendered notion of the parka. The poor and homeless, which are plentiful, are renamed lovers of the open air, or khule asman ke aashik. Akhtar's playful and light-hearted approach to this dark future is reinforced in the preface to his novella, where he claims that he was inspired to write Bees of Yara after reading reviews of George Orwell's novel 1984, instead of the novel itself. So this is like, he insists that unlike Orwell's work, his novella is not meant to be read as a critique of a fascist state, and ends the preface by his ultimately optimistic interpretation of the world of the novella. He says, quote, Perhaps you will find this world strange, bizarre, crooked in many ways. Yet despite all of its frailties, I believe it glows and thrums with the warmth of human love." End quote. Akhtar's own assessment of the work and the ultimately hopeful tone of the novella brings to mind the concept of the critical dystopia rather than a classical dy dystopia in the vein of Orwell's 1984. According to Thomas Moylan in Scrapes of the Untainted Sky, a critical dystopia is one which recognizes the redemptive qualities of the dystopian world it creates and offers possibilities of transforming or changing this world through the alliance of diverse voices and perspectives. Unlike the static worlds of earlier South Asian utopias, critical dystopias are heterogeneous and uninterested in black or white absolutes. Moylan says, quote, the critical dystopian vision of the 1980s and 90s took a hard look at the bad new times of contemporary enclosure and within a sober apprehension of the intensified exploitation, endeavor to find traces, scraps, and sometimes horizons of utopian possibility. End quote. I argue that Akhtar's B. Sogyara is an early example of such a heterotopic and critical imagining of the future in Pakistani science fiction. Uh, 
if the futuristic visions of the latter half of the 20th century represented a dark futurity as authors grappled with post-colonial state failures, geopolitics, and the effects of neo-colonialism, the 21st century has only added to these anxieties being explored by Pakistani science fiction writers in their imagined futures. Climate change and the growing power of corporations working in tandem with or even overtaking state governments are two of the most common threats that are discernible amongst contemporary Pakistani futuristic writing. This is unsurprising given the level of destruction climate change is already bringing to the subcontinent as well as the increasingly precarious and exploitative position South Asian countries have in the neo-colonial global marketplace. A third common anxiety that these futuristic visions bring to life is the sinister and rapidly advancing surveillance technologies in the hands of corporations and state governments. These urgent global and planetary concerns have led to a flowering of dark futuristic imaginings. One of the more recent addition to this category, the Pakistani Urdu animated film, Shehde Tabassum, The City of Smiles. So written by Aisha Ibtihar and Arafat Mazhar and directed by the latter, the nine minute long short film was produced by Puffball Studios, an independent animation design studio in Lahore. The film explores Pakistan in 2071. The prologue states that after a protracted and violent civil war, the state has finally established an era of stability, peace and innovation. In this country of supposed contentment, it is illegal for citizens to express any emotion other than happiness. The state closely monitors each citizen's emotional state through the mandated use of a high-tech headgear known as hasmuk and polices their speech and expression via flying boards. All forms of dissatisfaction from personal unhappiness to political dissent are therefore outlawed. The hasmuk device awards you points based on how well you comply with the law of perpetual smiling. And these points in turn are the prevailing currency of the country, thus showing the ultimate collaboration between a totalitarian state, unchecked capitalism, and advanced surveillance technology. In its tone of cautionary despair, Shehre Tabassum can be seen as a classical uh, dystopia in the same vein as Orwell's 1984. As Robert Seyfried explains, a classical dystopia is the antithesis of a utopian narrative. Dystopia is described not by a fascinated visitor, but, but by an inhabitant of an apparent good society that from the inside does not look very good at all. End quote. The term that screenwriter and director Mazhar uses to describe the film's political and generic inclinations is cyber khilafat, a hybrid form that combines the aesthetics of cyberpunk with the specific religious and ideological anxieties of contemporary Pakistan. Cyber khilafat, Mazhar argues, quote, explore modern forms of Islam, technology and power combined to corrupt language and dictate political and social norms to mute individual identity. End quote. The term is meant to tease out the perpetual contradiction of contemporary Pakistan's supposed avowal of democratic values and its simultaneous embracing of elements of a quote, supremacist <coughs> khilafat state. End quote. Shehre Tabassum in exploring the dark anxieties of mothers uh, cyber philosophers ideas fit into the addition uh, into the tradition of anti-utopias which Moylan argues are closed words examining the negative impulses of humanity ending in a dis despair of awareness the end of Shehre Tabassum however does have a glimmer of a utopian impulse as the unarmed female protagonist whose perspective the audience is experiencing this futuristic city through takes off her hasmuk hus device and stares into her reflection in a mirror as her state-mandated smile fades into an expression of snarling defiance. The film thus ends with this image containing a potential transformation of the dystopian world it has created. How much time do I have? Should I skip the third text? Yeah, we, we, can, yeah. we can have more discussions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so I'll just end and then we'll have more time to discuss. So the radical possibilities offered by Pakistani science fiction Writing stand in stark contrast to the grim realism genre of literary fiction that is usually privileged in South Asian literary discourse, as well as in the global, global literary marketplace. The fiction which is most often talked about in literature festivals or which gets reviewed and critiqued in newspapers and journals is that which utilizes the generic tropes of literary realism to explore South Asian stereotypes <coughs> like hunger, crowding, terror, and poverty. This is particularly true of anglophone writing in Pakistan's particularly post 
this privileging of certain kind of genre and form has, I think, led to a narrowing of the Pakistani literary imagination, which in turn has limited the narrative possibilities we have for imagining our futures. The realist form is proving to be increasingly less relevant in helping us make sense of our contemporary situation. Our reality today is outlandish and almost fantastical in its absurdity and bleakness, and requires a matching radicalness to meet it. Perhaps the sheer audacity of the science fiction genre is the only one equipped to do the job. And in order to keep us somewhat on time, even though I think we're running really late, I do want us to open up the question and answer. Um, it would be good also if you can sort of draw connections between the two presentations, because I've seen lots of them, and uh, ask your questions to our presenters. Um, and then we'll take a short break so people can do their bio breaks and whatnot. Uh, before we get into our next keynote speaker. Okay, let me open it up to everybody. I have lots of things to say, but I won't. <laughs> um, I have a question about Vaisni, Sabi. Yes. So you mentioned that the language would be Hindi, Urdu, but it would be Nagri. And so why Nagri? And then the second question is what about Islam? Like uh, what would happen to religions that have a particular, um, I mean, um, injunctions about property? systems, right? Like, how would he create, I mean, I guess it's a utopia, so it doesn't address how, but what about Islam? Where is that going to go in the system? Um, yes, why Nagri is a really interesting question. Um, this, the 1910s and 1920s is obviously like the high point of like the Hindi, Urdu debate, conflict, whatever you can call it. There's, there's plenty of scholarship on that. Um, why Nagri? I think this is where his own Arya Samaj's, like the Hindu revivalist kind of background comes in. Uh, it is a very political <coughs> choice to uh, pick Nagri as the script for this language called Bhartiya, uh, instead of um, anything related to Urdu. Uh, in fact, much this is one of his early Arya Samaj's views that he keeps until the end of his life because after he formally joins the Communist Party, he still advocates for the adoption of Nagri as the script for modern uh, post-colonial India. Um, and this gets him, uh, I think this gets him um, uh, suspended from the Communist Party, which was officially like they wanted like a language which did not pick sides. So by this time, Nagri had come to mean Hindu and uh, Urdu had come to mean Nasti, like had come to mean like, um, uh, Muslim. Uh, so he, this is like a very Adi Samadhi choice, I would say. Uh, why? Um, so yeah, what happens to Islam uh, property? So what happens to religion in this text is that it just disappears. Uh, it says like it, it has a very functionalist understanding of religion as something that exists only if there is social strife and class inequality. So if that is resolved as a problem, uh, which in the 22nd century that it imagines it is, uh, religion simply ceases to um, exist. So people have names, like for instance, there are characters called Ismail, Fatima, etc. Uh, but they're not even religious names, just like Vishwabandhu is not like a Hindu name for him. The, the religion does not exist. So I think that kind of related to that is the point that you were making that a lot of this fiction sort of um, leaps, leapfrogs over right. the issues of our reality, right. right? And then just presents this future that is um, whatever it is. It's complicated actually right. in its it own is. way. It's yeah. not really that simple. And there are elements of the reality, but it's kind of glossed over in right. a way. Um, but I think your work, which by the way, love those visuals, um, very colorful, very impressive. Um, like what you're talking about is, and you're also connecting to the visual and not just the textual. So would you talk a little bit about what the value is of that, mm -hmm. perhaps? Right, sure. I mean, Shahira Tabassum, I think, and just the, the puffball studios and they've put out other um, short films as well. I mean, I think the visual has a different power than the literary. 
particularly, I mean, if we talk about, of, of course, the literary text in the context of Pakistan, then language becomes, um, you know, like an issue, right? In the sense that uh, writings in, in English are still only accessible to a very, very minor, uh, like minor elite class. Um, whereas with the visual, I think it opens it up, it, it makes it more accessible um, for large members of, so for large uh, community of Pakistanis. And Shahirat Abbasum, I also particularly like because it's an Urdu, it makes, uh, you know, it makes its ideas very comprehensible in both written Urdu, so there's, if you see the film, it's available on YouTube for free. Um, you know, through its subtitles, but also in like the language that it uses. And I think, um, and I think for with, it's perhaps harder to imagine in literary texts, um, you know, the kinds of worlds that are being depicted. Um, whereas with with the visual, it's something that's right there, right? And it, it requires a different kind of, I think, analytical and critical sort of lens. But I think it's more conducive to more people sort of joining into the conversation, which I appreciate. I mean, I'm obviously biased on the side of literature, uh, but I have to say, I mean, of course, you know, art um, and just, you know, visual culture of all kinds has has a very important role. Thank you. Uh, um, first Kira, you. then you, then you, okay? Am I, am I yes, you're first. Okay. Um, so, thank you. Uh, that, that was very interesting, in, interesting panels. I had a, I had one specific question for me, and I guess the, the question I was thinking about was, and there's a kind of larger, I think, if you think about fiction writing right now, there's a larger moment where no one's actually imagining utopias anymore, right? It's all dystopias. All video games are dystopias, all movies are dystopias, even remakes of Star Trek are also more dystopian than they were before, right? I and mean, they started as more dystopian, but now it has kind of become a special dystopian. So there is a kind of larger moment of dystopia, um, which has to do with, you know, sort of the 20th century, I guess, right? And then there is kind of other moment where, uh, where, you know, especially the kind of, you know, the second novel that you discussed, uh, where it almost is kind of like this American anxiety about China, right, like, you know, the social credit, etc. right, that's kind of in the air again, right, so I was kind of wondering to what extent is the, is the kind of idea of dystopia that you're imagining, or even utopia, so it's what I matter, to what extent are they really kind of adopted as or kind of coming out of, you know, both movies out of, uh, you know, outside of academic conference, but, you know, where, to what extent are they emerging out of South Asia, right? Like, what is South Asia in that sense, right? Besides the sort of vibrant pink instead of the dusty brown, right, aesthetic. Um, and to what extent are they really kind of part of a larger global conversation, for me, which which is really, you know, in that sense, how are they working in a separate way or imagining mm -hmm. a different or the worse future, yeah. right, for everyone? Thank you. Right. Yes, yeah, so this is a good question. This is a question that I've been thinking about as I, because my work is on sort of tracing a tradition of science fiction in South Asia, so like in Urdu, also in Hindi. So this is a question I think about a lot. In terms of dystopia and utopia, I would say that there is something, uh, like a perspective is added when uh, a utopia or a dystopia is imagined from like a very specific South Asian, like localized context, right? So with, with for example, Shehre Tabassam, um, it takes, um, it takes, anxieties of contemporary Pakistanis and and you know the ways in which the state works and the ways in which uh, surveillance technology works um, which might not uh, which might have resonances of course globally right because these are not trends that are happening just in South Asia but they manifest in very particular ways so another film that uh, Puffball Studios uh, took out was is called Swipe and it's uh, it's about this app where you can basically um, swipe right or left on people um, who have committed crimes or sins and you if you swipe right it's uh, that they are Vajibul Khatan which is I mean it's a very it's a very horrifying kind of a thing right if you swipe left um, they are forgiven for their sin um, and you know you, you get points and it becomes kind of a, a, a game and this is a very black mirror kind of a concept but the way in which it's working it's very much Sort of embedded in uh, in Pakistani history, right? The sort of um, uh, the law against Ahmadis, for example, and the ways in which this idea of the blasphemy law or um, uh, is sort of weaponized um, against religious minorities, but also used against sort of political descendants, right? So I think the specifics tell us a lot, not just about South Asia 
in particular, but also about how these global trends manifest in different ways based on location and, and history. So we have two questions. Uh, can we try to make them a little not too complex so we have time? And we, because we don't want to delay the next keynote, but you're next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the presentations. Um, I was wondering. Indigeneity and indigenous future is something that I'm deeply interested about and I'm still trying to um, sort of figure out how the theoretical, the rich theoretical work that has been done in indigenous studies can be applied to, to the South Asian context because it's different, the term indigenous uh, means different things I think in South Asia, particularly in contemporary South Asia where it sometimes, uh, you know, sort of rightist kinds of uh, governments use it. Uh, for political ends, like saying, oh, you know, we, the, we were here first and so the other people, you know, for example, in India, that would be the case. But that being said, I do think that uh, there are ways in which indigenous communities in various parts of South Asia, um, so for example, in Pakistan, in Sindh, there is a, um, there's a very old uh, sort of fisher folk community that's in Sindh, that's in Karachi, and th their relationship to the land and to the to the ways in which you know change has occurred and destroyed their livelihoods as well as the world, they will have a unique perspective, right? And I do want. Um, I mean, there's something I think about that you know this. It, you can't really imagine a future for South Asia if you're not taking into account these multiplicity of um, of like perspectives that different indigenous communities because South Asia also has such a specific like such a wide range of indigenous communities that are specifically located. But this is definitely well, a very good question and I want to keep thinking about But I do want to bring that point actually a little bit further since we are in Hawaii and it is an indigenous place, uh, people. Uh, and what I wanted to say is what I have noticed and observed uh, that uh, a lot of indigenous writers are moving towards graphic novels to talk about their futures that are really tied to their own traditions that have been sort of elided or, you know, um, and, and, and taking that into the future, not keeping it in the past, which is what a lot of times, like it's a sort of decolonial project in a way to, to look at your tradition in the future. So I think a lot of the graphic work actually, and that's why I think mm -hmm. I was inspired somewhat, somewhat by yeah, the and visuals. Yeah, I can add also, so for example, um, so Joshua Whitehead is a scholar who works and has edited anthologies of indigenous fut futurism stories. And he says that for indigenous people here um, in America, the, the, dis the apocalypse, the dystopia already happened, right? And this is, this is the dystopia that they've been living in throughout. And, and so I think it, it is any I, sort of articulation of the future which does not take into account um, this very, very major historical point and will be incomplete and dishonest also. So it is, I think, crucial to engage with it. Okay, one more question and then we'll uh, wrap it up because we're running a little bit late. Vijay. There's yeah. this person. Oh, no, uh, sorry, you uh, gotta uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> please, please wait. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know he isn't going to make his short end quick. No, no, no. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Go ahead, please. Sorry for that. Um, so, I, I, Andrew's um, presentation was about utopias and technological advancement sort of blurring or bringing an uh, end to past divides of sorts. And uh, you had this artwork from Shazan Malik about Begum Rukhaya's um, mm -hmm. uh, Ladyland. Uh, from 1905, which is also about feminist uh, mm -hmm. sci-fi sort of gender reversals and all that. And now the ones, the films that you talk about, um, I watched these and they're so scary, you know, they yeah. resonate with you so much. Um, and these are more like, you know, uh, like you said, you know, uh, the idea of dystopia. So do you see, you know, in the current work, this, you know, for 
beautiful imagination is sort of becoming darker or just because of the realities or uh, is it just that um, earlier um, 20th century work was sort of you know more into the idea of utopias and I don't know how you see it and how you look at it but do you want to yeah um, thank you for that question I've also been thinking about it I didn't put it in the presentation because I had not finished thinking about what it means uh, but like I said, I think one way in which I started thinking about it was through um, Susan Buck Morse's work. Um, Susan Buck Morse, that's her name. Um, uh, so she has like a book on the dream worlds um, of the tw early 20th century and what happens to them eventually, where both the Fordist and the Stalinist, I, I don't really agree perhaps with the equation of them, uh, but like uh, what she talks about mechanization as like a failed dream almost, which I find very interesting to think about in relation to this, the kind of optimism that technology will lead us to like a, a place of like social equality that sort of really disappears I think throughout like the Cold War years especially. Uh, and it's interesting to think about why. I don't have a specific answer to this, um, except that I am still thinking about it, especially through this framework. Why does this strike us as both a little outdated as well as slightly scary? Can we really just say that, okay, mechanization is the reason for like caste divisions disappearing in society? Um, I'm, I'm still grappling with that. Thank you, Vijay. We'll just leave it to one person <laughs> responding, is that yeah. okay? And you can continue the conversation after. Yeah, I, firstly, fantastic work, really, uh, super. I was thinking a lot about, uh, you know, when once Gabriel Garcia Marquez was asked about magical realism, mm -hmm. and he said, I actually don't write magical realism, I write about Colombia today. Yeah. And in a way, yeah. you know, Bengali science fiction, sorry to take it back to Bengal, goes back to the 19th century. Yeah, yeah Jagdish Chandra Bose and people. And Rukhaya is yeah. the embodiment of that. Of and it's just lovely how they believed in technology. Right. But the other thing is, guys, imagine you come from a village in India or Pakistan and you come into a big city and you see a mall that looks like a UFO. Yes. You know, I mean, there's a way in which science fiction is a reality yes. in South Asia, yes. right? I wanted you to talk about that. It's not science fiction as the future, but science fiction as the as the present. Yeah. I think that's a great yes. question to think Thank about you. deeply, <laughs> honestly. And with that, uh, Vijay, you have the last word. Um, is that okay with everybody? Take your bio break. We should be back.